what she experienced. With buying land is a value who's taken from the white culture. So that even Silas, who seems to represent the resistance, the protest, the opposition to white culture, is already implicated in white culture. He's already involved in the norms of white culture. And it is he, really, who going off and leaving her there alone, she's been alone for over a week by the time the events of the story take place, he's also tempted by what white culture has to give him. And I think that what Richard Wright's story gives us, in addition to his very clear political message about what uh, white culture has done to uh, the black community, what he's also giving us is the idea that there's no way that you can not want the things that are surrounding you and that represent the achievement of the culture of which you're a part, even if the culture is to be blamed for certain kinds of offenses against you. Uh, and I would say that the Long Black Song is a song of, that is the Long Black Song, the story that Richard Wright uh, is producing, is a Long Black Song of Desire. But the word long there also expresses long, the wish for something, the desire for something. And then part of the reason that the story is a powerful work of literature, and not simply a kind of journalistic statement in pretty um, creative words, is because it makes us feel this desire, the longing for something else. And insofar as he, in Richard Wright's readership is uh, a white audience and not only a black audience, uh, what the story is also able to achieve is a feeling on the part of the white reader of longing, of desire. Uh, it's, it's a way of producing an identification between the black author and the black community he represents and the white readership, um, which might have trouble understanding that uh, black people don't simply want these things because uh, they don't want to be oppressed. They want these things because they share certain values uh, with white culture, that they've grown up in white culture. Uh, in fact, one of, I can't have time to develop this here, but one of the important divisions in the African American community is the division between uh, black people who in the 1960s, that is, not, not in the period of this story, but later, um, identify black people with history in Africa and stress the African component, components of black culture. And black people who carry on the tradition of writers like Richard Wright and who identify black people as being inherently American. Uh, in fact, as being among the, the, the most um, uh, uh, established and primary uh, American groups. African Americans arrive in the United States uh, before the United States exists as a nation. They're part of the colonial period. <clears throat> Many uh, Africans um, in the, in the uh, 17th century actually achieved emancipation, achieved freedom, and there were always in the American South communities of free blacks who sometimes forget this because of the dominance of slavery in America. Uh, and there's a very long, a strong African-American position, which has to do with African-Americans as being the quintessential American. And part of what this story is doing then is laying claim to the ways in which African-Americans are Americans, like all of Americans. They want the same thing. They want <coughs> photographs. They want music. Uh, they want romance. Uh, they want love. They want their lives. To, they want land. They want their lives to be much like the lives of uh, the other members of their world. Okay, so what, what this long black song then is, is certainly a song of, it's a litany, it's a song of complaint, but it's also a song, as I said, of longing. I'm going to take, I, I, I'm going to take a few minutes uh, just to say one or two words about um, the story that I'm not going to be able to discuss. Uh, at length, um, the story by Maxine Kong Kingston, uh, who's a Chinese American writer. Uh, Chinese American writing is somewhat newer than African American writing. Uh, and um, Maxine Kong Kingston is really one of the premier Chinese American writers. Um, 
the uh, volume, which is entitled Woman Warrior, isn't a, a fictional text in, in the same way that Richard Wright's collection is a fictional text. It's actually a memoir. But it's a memoir which threads together both memories of Maxine Han Kingston's own childhood, growing up as a Chinese American, of Chinese born parents. And it, it, it incorporates um, stories that her mother told her about her life in China. And it also includes legends, different legends that also her mother told her uh, when she was a child. The first story, which is a, an extremely uh, famous story because of the way in which it is a very feminist story to it. Maxine Han Kingston has two political uh, platforms. One is uh, the, the um, uh, representation of the ethnic experience of Chinese Americans. Uh, in that sense, she's like Richard Wright, representing an ethnic group. But as a woman writer, uh, Maxine Han Kingston is very much uh, taken up with the issue of women. And for this reason, she has uh, a doubly divided loyalty. Her experience growing up in America is a very difficult experience, and she has many, many objections to American culture. And that points her toward Chinese culture. On the other hand, Chinese culture, as she experiences both through the way in which she's treated by her family and by the stories they tell about China, is also very um, <coughs> hostile to women, very discriminatory against women. So she has an attraction to Chinese culture, but also a tremendous opposition to it. And the passages that I put on the sheet, and I'm just going to read these and say just a very few, few words to, again, suggest how this writer is making political points about what it is to be a Chinese American woman, okay? And at the same time, expressing a tremendous ambivalence about this. She, she, she knows what she objects to. She has all of these rational, intellectual arguments that she can make, objecting to American culture, vis -vis the Chinese community, uh, objections she can make about the Chinese community, vis-a-vis -vis the treatment of women, and yet she is an American, she is a Chinese woman, and she um, wants what both of these cultures to give her. Uh, so this is the way the first story in the volume begins. Uh, no Name Woman is the name of the story. Uh, if any of you have read or know uh, Ralph, Wal uh, Ralph Waldo Ellison's Invisible Man, which is one of the classics of African American uh, fiction, uh, you'll, you may catch in the, the title No Name Woman uh, a kind of strategy similar to that of Invisible Man. Uh, the No Name Woman it doesn't exist but then she comes to exist as a woman without a name, and she becomes very vivid to us in this way. Uh, Ellison's invisible man is invisible. We start to call him invisible man to the point that he becomes very visible to us. And in both cases, because we don't have a name for the character, for the protagonist, we begin to think of the character as the writer. So the no-name woman becomes very closely identified with Maxine Conquista herself, uh, even though Literally, she's the aunt. This is how the story begins. You must not tell anyone, my mother said, what I'm, I am about to tell you. In China, your father had a sister who killed herself. She jumped into the family well. We say that your father has old brothers because it is as if she had never been born. Okay, that's how it opens, and this is how it ends. My aunt haunts me. Her ghost drawn to me because now, after 50 years of neglect, I alone devote pages of paper to her though not origami, into houses and clothes. I do not think she always means me well. I am telling on her, and she was a spiked suicide, drowning herself in the drinking water. The Chinese are always very frightened of the drowned one, whose weeping ghost, wet hair hanging and skin bloated, waits silently by the water to pull down a substitute. Okay, I'm just going to make two points. One is uh, the fact that the story begins by violating a, an injunction given to her by her mother. My mother, it, it, you must not tell anyone what I'm about to tell you, right? This is how the story begins. And of course, she's telling this to all of us. Right? So in the act of repeating her mother's words, she is violating um, the mother's uh, instruction not to tell her. It's an act of 
aggression against her mother. It's an act of revenge, and that's the second, uh, in the second passage as well. The aunt is a spike suicide. She drowns herself in drinking water. Why? To poison the well. The community, what's happened is the, the aunt has become pregnant while her husband is off uh, in America in the 1920s, um, uh, employed um, uh, as was typically the case in building railroads, um, and she therefore could not be pregnant by her husband. It's an illegitimate birth, a pregnancy, and the villagers raid the house. And uh, she gives birth to the baby, and then she drowns herself and the baby in the well. But by doing that, she takes her revenge. She, she, she spikes her side. She takes her revenge against the village. The niece who's writing this, Maxine Hampton, is similarly involved in an act of revenge. She's taking her revenge against her mother, who tells her the story to warn her to be a good girl. And in that sense, she is taking on the ancestor's case, right? She's, she's continuing that revenge. In continuing the revenge, she's in a sense putting herself back into the tradition. So that even while she's being angry and vengeful and spiteful, she is accepting the way in which revenge and spite are expressed in this tradition which belongs to her mother's culture and not to her own. The very last word of the story, the very last word of the second of those two little passages is the word substitute. What she, she does is risk becoming a substitute for the aunt. She actually risks her own death. She says, you know, my aunt may just grab me down into the well with her. Uh, there's almost a kind of suicidal urge here that she's expressing. She risks that, risks her own death, and risk becoming a substitute for the aunt who will also be forgotten. In other words, she's saying, if I tell this story and my mother reads it, you know, I may also become a no-name woman. But I'm willing to take that risk because I am, at the same time that I'm defying the community, I am taking on their tradition uh, and their mores and expressing them. And so what we have is the writer, again, caught in a position of ambivalence, wanting one thing, wanting another, and giving us a story which positions us directly at the center of that struggle. And I think the reason that it works as literature and isn't just a political statement about China or America is because of the way in which it galvanizes our um, feelings in relation to this struggle. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you with this. <laughs>
So uh, I have questions now. Okay. Anyway, uh, the question is, I, 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 I really pointed out that the real Chinese translation of the woman warrior is only a Chinese word. Uh, it is called Nui Jia. And uh, are you aware of the significance, the significance of Nui Jia, the woman warrior? Because it's not accidental. The word Nui Jia appeared in most of our Chinese uh, yeah, well, I mean, story. I, mean, I, I know about the legend, but the, the, the second story in the volume, which is not actually called The Woman Warrior, but it, it, it's the story of The Woman Warrior, has, uh, at least the way she tells the story, has very fundamentally to do with um, her own craft as a writer, or her mother's, which she identifies her mother with, which is what she calls talk story. In other words, her mother is also a writer in the sense that she tells stories. And the image that she gives at the end of the story about The Woman Warrior is the woman warrior having all of the complaints of the community written Kerr 就是那个作为太太 so what it is, the reason why I thought is, once a woman warrior got married, it is the Chinese culture that becomes the greatest oppressor. Mm -hmm. And so she is full of yuan, bitterness. Mm -hmm. And eventually, she, she did not commit suicide by coming into the well. Nonetheless, uh, her life was really become, uh, really did become insignificant. So you can see that the Chinese culture is very important. So you can see that the Chinese culture is very important. And you can see that the Chinese culture is very important. 可是他的一生也变得非常的平凡。那这个是不是我们宗教、宗教里面的中国人的礼教之人呢？It is the Chinese culture that has this habit of destroying something very good in being a woman warrior. Because even in the martial arts，就是讲武术来说的话啊，这些女将啊，无论她是那个范丽华也好，或者那个儿儿女英雄传的那个那个女英雄，或者那个三甲三甲朱家庄的那个啊。那个一丈青他们都是在武术上面在才子上面呢都比那个男性强很多的武术可是等到他们一被收编了一归顺朝廷以后呢他们就做那个很普通的女性叫一品夫人呢可一品夫人是怎么样的啊也是很无聊的生
Uh -huh. uh, can we find any similarity between the two stories? Which name? Hua Mong Lan. Do you know the cartoon Hua Mong Lan? They they might. Um, I mean, the the uh, in in the next story in this volume, which is the one about the woman warrior, she is of course disguised as as, as a man, and then as she, when she goes out as a warrior, uh, and um, what. I mean, what's interesting about what Maxine Hong Kingston is doing is that, um, and it's even in this passage, in the, in the sense that she's saying that she doesn't origami uh, paper in memory of her aunt, but, but writes words, is that she is trying to move from a, um, a culture of objects, of material things, or a warrior in the literal sense of the word with armor, to the ways in which words can become a form of um, military action, uh, words in the very strict, um, uh, you know, written sense of them, uh, and that her the book becomes again, you know, for me, literary titles uh, are very often not so much allusions to the subject of the text as they are definitions of what the text is. The book called the Woman Warrior is a female warrior. In other words, it is a warring voice, uh, which is speaking out of language uh, this kind of, of pain uh, and so on and so forth. But I, I don't know the connection to the other text. I, mean, I just digress to something else.简单的一个翻译呢，你看那个，在那个《Woman 所以在某一个方面来说的话这么像花木兰一样所以这个是一个大家就是一个最小的可以洗到你们回家这个寒假呢就是把那个 然后呢，就被关在后面了，然后再再也没有机会，就是那个出来。然后日本的好像他们的王妃不是一样吗？是一个才女去牛津大学读书，是一个外交官。结果呢，一进了宫廷以后呢，就已经就得到那个忧郁